Chapter 1. The Birth of Water Long, long ago, before there were any people, before there were any animals or plants, even before there were any oceans, our planet was a lonely, dry rock floating in space. But do you ever wonder where all the water came from that covers over 70% of our Earth? Scientists have a few ideas about this. One theory suggests that water arrived from outer space, not by aliens, but on comets. Yes, you heard it right. I see comets from the farthest parts of our solar system might have crashed into the Earth billions of years ago. When they hit our planet, the ice melted and created water. That's one way we think water could have come to Earth. But there's another theory, too. Some scientists believe that water was always here. Hidden deep within the Earth, hot rocks and gases released water that slowly came to the surface. Over time, this water covered our planet. So, was it comets from outer space, or was it water from deep within the Earth? The truth is, we don't know for sure. But these theories give us some exciting ideas to think about. Let's imagine now. The water has come, either from space or from deep within the Earth. But how did it become the great oceans that we see today? As more and more water started covering the Earth, it began to form huge bodies called oceans. The lowest parts of the land were filled first. The water kept filling these areas until they became our first seas and oceans. And once there were oceans, life wasn't far behind. But that's a story for the next chapter. Just think, the water in your bottle, the water in your bathtub, the water you drink and play in, might have come from comets from far away space or from deep, deep down in the earth. It formed the great oceans and seas, the first homes for life on earth. Isn't that a wonderful thought? This chapter begins our fantastic journey of water and life. It's a journey full of surprises, full of mysteries, and full of life. So hold tight, keep wondering, keep thinking, and let's dive into the next chapter. Chapter 2. Water and the Evolution of Life As our journey continues, we dive deep into the past, when the first seas and oceans had just formed on Earth. Back then, our planet looked quite different from today. There were no trees, no birds singing, no animals running around. But there was water, and that's where our story begins. Imagine the vast oceans as far as your eyes can see. Underneath, something magical was happening. Inside the water, tiny particles were floating around. These were not alive. They were like pieces of a puzzle, waiting to be put together. Over time, in the warm and gentle waters, these pieces came together to form the first simple forms of life. They were not like any animals or plants we see today. They were very tiny, even smaller than a dot at the end of this sentence. They were called microbes. Even though they were small, they were very important. These little microbes were the first living things on Earth. But why did life start in water? Well, water is very special. It's like a home where these tiny particles could meet and join. It's like a blanket that protects life from the harsh sun. It's like a highway that allows nutrients to move around. Without water, these particles might have never joined, and life as we know it would not exist. So, the next time you see a body of water, think about this. It could be an ocean, a lake, a river, or even a small puddle. Remember that water is not just H2O, it's the cradle of life. It's the place where life on Earth began, all those billions of years ago. And it continues to support life in many ways, even today. We'll explore more about how water continues to sustain life in the next part of our journey. Get ready, because there's a lot more to discover. In this chapter, we've seen how water played a critical role in the birth of life on Earth. It truly is a magical element, don't you think? Now let's continue our adventure as we learn more about the many wonders of water. After the tiny microbes started life in the ocean, something incredible began to happen. They started to change. They started to grow. This process, my dear readers, is called evolution. So, why did the microbes start to evolve? Well, they wanted to survive. They wanted to eat better, live longer, 
and stay safe from danger. To do this, they needed to adapt to their environment. They needed to evolve. Over millions of years, these tiny microbes slowly transformed. They grew bigger, they grew more complex, and they learned new ways to survive. Some of them developed a way to make their own food using sunlight. We call this process photosynthesis. The tiny microbes that could do this turned into the first simple plants in the sea. As time went on, some microbes evolved into creatures that could move. They developed tiny tails or wings to swim in the water. These were the first simple animals. They started eating the tiny plants in the sea and each other. The oceans were full of life now. It was a grand dance of survival, with each form of life trying to outdo the other. Slowly but surely, more complex life forms evolved. From tiny microbes to fish, from simple sea plants to large underwater forests. And all this happened under the water. Think about that the next time you look at a fish tank, or when you see a fish swimming in a pond. Those fish are part of a story that's billions of years old. A story of survival, of change, and of life. And water was there at every step, helping life to grow and thrive. So that's the end of our second chapter. We've seen how life started in water, and how it evolved into countless forms. From tiny microbes to complex fish, water has been the stage of the drama of life. It's been quite a journey so far, hasn't it? And we've only just begun. Let's dive into the next chapter to discover more about the wonders of water. Chapter 3. Rivers. The Veins of Life. We've seen how life began in the oceans, but what about on land? Well, the story of life on land begins with rivers. Rivers are like veins on our earth, carrying water from the mountains to the sea. Along their journey, they give life to the land and to us. Imagine the earliest people walking across a dry land. They would need water to drink, to clean themselves, to cook their food. Where would they find this water? In rivers, of course. Rivers became the lifeline for these early humans. They would settle near rivers, where they had enough water to drink and to grow their food. These small settlements started growing. They turned into villages, then into towns, and then into big cities. In fact, some of the oldest civilizations in human history, like the Egyptians, the Chinese, and the Indians, all started near rivers. Why was this so? Well, rivers provided everything these early humans needed. The water was there for drinking and cleaning. The river also brought rich soil from the mountains. This soil was very good for growing crops. Rivers were also full of fish, providing food. They were like highways, making travel and trade easier. So, the rivers were not just veins carrying water. They were veins carrying life, carrying progress. They allowed us to grow, to build cities, to start civilizations. We wouldn't be where we are today without rivers. Next time you see a river, remember this. That gentle flow of water has helped build civilizations. It has given life to the land and to us. And it continues to do so even today. And so, we see how water has not only given birth to life, but also to our civilizations. It's fascinating, isn't it? But our journey doesn't stop here. Let's continue exploring the wonders of water in our next chapter. As our journey continues along the rivers, let's look at the world around them. Can you see the trees, the bushes, and the grasses? Can you see the birds, the insects, and the animals? This whole world that lives and breathes along the river, we call it an ecosystem. Rivers are more than just water flowing from mountains to the sea. They are homes to many plants and animals. Some animals, like fish and frogs, live inside the water. They swim in it, they feed in it, they lay their eggs in it. But the river also supports life beyond its water. Birds like the kingfisher dive into the river to catch fish. Insects like the dragonfly lay their eggs near the river. Animals like deer and elephants come to the river to drink water. Plants also thrive near rivers. Tall trees, lush grasses, and beautiful flowers grow along the riverbanks. They drink from the river, and their roots hold the soil together. In return, they give shade and food to the animals and birds. 
all these plants and animals are linked. They depend on each other for survival. They form a chain, a cycle of life. This is the river's ecosystem. It's a vibrant, busy world full of life. Each river creates its own ecosystem, its own world of life. From the tiny insects to the big elephants, from the small grasses to the tall trees, each one plays a part in this world. And at the center of it all is the river, giving life to everything around it. So, the next time you're near a river, take a moment to look around. See the ecosystem that the river supports. Remember that the river is more than just water. It's a world of life. And you're a part of it too. That's the end of our third chapter. We've learned so much about the magic of water. And there's still so much more to discover. Let's continue our journey in the next chapter. Chapter 4. Life in the Oceans Let's now dive into the deep blue oceans. They cover more than 70% of our Earth. But did you know they are also home to countless living things? Yes, life in the oceans is as diverse and colorful as life on land. Let's explore this wonderful world together. Imagine diving into the ocean. As you go deeper, you start to see life in all its forms. You see tiny creatures, like the playful clownfish hiding among the sea anemones. You see the majestic manta rays gliding through the water like birds in the sky. You see the strange and wonderful creatures, like the glowing jellyfish and the camouflaging octopus. You may even see a giant blue whale, the largest animal to ever live on Earth. Or you may see a school of dolphins dancing and singing together. You may see a hungry shark, a quick turtle, a slow starfish. The ocean is full of life. But it's not just animals. The oceans are also home to many plants. Have you heard of seaweed? It's a type of plant that grows in the sea. Or what about the great underwater forests of kelp, where many sea creatures find food and shelter? The oceans are like a big, big family. Every plant, every animal, big or small, has a role to play. They all need each other to survive. They all make the oceans beautiful, vibrant, and full of life. So, the next time you see the vast ocean, remember this. It's not just a large body of water. It's a living, breathing world. It's a home for countless plants and animals. It's a treasure of life. As we wrap up the first part of our oceanic adventure, we realize how magical and lively the world beneath the waves is. The oceans are truly a wonder of nature and there's still so much to discover. Let's continue our journey in the next part. As we dive deeper into the oceans, we come across something magical. Something colorful and bustling with life. Can you guess what it is? It's a coral reef. Let's explore this underwater paradise together. Coral reefs are like cities under the sea. They are built by tiny creatures called corals. Each coral is very small, but together, they build massive structures. These structures become home to many oceanic plants and animals. Imagine a city full of life. You see fish of every color, shape, and size. You see sea turtles, sea stars, and seahorses. You see clams, crabs, and shrimp. You see plants from tiny algae to big seaweeds. All this life, living together in harmony, that's a coral reef for you. But why are coral reefs important? Well, they are important for many reasons. They provide food and shelter for many oceanic creatures. They protect the coastline from storms and waves. They even help in cleaning the water. Sadly, coral reefs are in danger. Pollution, climate change, and overfishing are harming them. If we lose coral reefs, we lose a precious part of our oceans. That's why we need to protect them. So. The next time you hear about coral reefs, remember this. They are not just pretty structures under the sea. They are living, breathing cities. They are homes for countless plants and animals. They are protectors of our coasts. They are the jewels of our oceans. As we end our fourth chapter, we've seen the magic of coral reefs. They show us how beautiful, vibrant, and important life in the oceans can be. They remind us of the wonders of water and why we need to protect it. 
Let's continue our journey in the next chapter as we discover more of the magic of water. Chapter 5 Rain, the Lifeline of Earth Have you ever wondered where rain comes from? Or why do rivers never run dry? The answer to these questions is a magical process called the water cycle. Let's explore this incredible journey together. Our story begins with the sun. The sun heats up the water in the seas, rivers, and lakes. This heat makes the water turn into a gas called water vapor. This process is called evaporation. Imagine a pot of boiling water. Can you see the steam rising? That's evaporation happening right in front of you. This water vapor rises up into the sky. As it goes higher, it starts to cool down. When it cools, it changes back into tiny water droplets. This change is called condensation. It's like when you see droplets of water on a cold glass of lemonade. That's condensation. These tiny water droplets come together to form clouds. When the clouds become too heavy, they drop the water back down to the earth. This falling of water is what we call rain, or precipitation. The rain fills up our rivers, lakes, and seas. It gives water to plants and animals. It gives us the water we drink and use every day. And then the sun shines again, and the cycle starts over. That's the water cycle for you. So, the next time it rains, remember this. That rain is a part of a magical journey. It's a journey that starts in the oceans, goes up into the sky, and comes back down to Earth. It's a journey that gives life to our planet. It's the wonderful water cycle. As we wrap up the first part of this chapter, we've seen how water travels around our planet. It's an amazing cycle, isn't it? And it's all thanks to water. Let's continue our journey in the next part as we explore more about the magic of rain. We've seen how rain is a part of the amazing water cycle. Now let's see what it does when it falls on land. Specifically, let's take a journey to one of the richest and most diverse places on our planet, the rainforests. Rainforests are like the jewels of our planet. They are home to more types of plants and animals than any other place on Earth. You can find tall trees, colorful flowers, chirping birds, crawling insects, and even mighty jaguars here. But have you ever wondered, what makes rainforests so full of life? The answer is, rain. The rain brings water to the rainforests. This water is vital for all the plants and animals that live here. The plants need it to grow and make food. The animals need it to drink and to find their food. But rain does more than just provide water. It also helps create the perfect conditions for life. Rain keeps the rainforest warm and humid. It brings nutrients from the sky down to the ground. It fills up rivers and streams, creating homes for fish and other creatures. Without rain, the rainforests would not exist. Without rainforests, our planet would lose a precious source of life. They are our largest source of oxygen, our greatest diversity of life, and our most potent weapon against climate change. So, the next time you see rain, remember this. It's not just water falling from the sky. It's a lifeline for our planet. It's the magic that gives life to the rainforests. It's the miracle of nature that we call rain. As we end our fifth chapter, We've discovered how rain nurtures one of the richest ecosystems on our planet, the rainforests. It's fascinating, isn't it? Let's continue our journey in the next chapter as we uncover more wonders of water. Chapter 6. The Silent Ice Our journey through the wonders of water now takes us to the coldest parts of our planet, the polar regions. Here, water exists in a different form, as ice. Let's discover the silent world of the polar caps together. The polar regions are located at the very top and bottom of our Earth. Here, the weather is so cold that water freezes into ice. This ice forms huge structures called ice caps. The North Pole is covered by the Arctic ice cap, while the South Pole is covered by the Antarctic ice cap. You might think that these ice caps are just cold, barren places. But that's not true. The ice caps are home to many animals. Some animals, like polar bears and seals, live on the ice. They hunt, sleep, and raise their families here. 
other animals, like penguins and whales, live in the water around the ice. They feed on the fish and krill that thrive in the cold water. But why are these ice caps important? Well, they play a crucial role in our planet's health. They reflect sunlight back into space, which helps regulate the Earth's temperature. They also store vast amounts of water. If the ice caps melt, they can cause sea levels to rise. This can lead to flooding in many parts of the world. So, the next time you think of ice, remember this. It's not just frozen water. It's a home for many animals. It's a shield that protects our planet from getting too warm. It's a giant store of water. It's a part of our world that we need to protect. As we wrap up the first part of this chapter, we've seen the magic of ice in the polar regions. It's an amazing world, isn't it? And it's all thanks to water. Let's continue our journey in the next part as we explore more about the silent world of ice. In the first part of this chapter, we explored the icy worlds of the polar regions. Now, let's delve deeper and meet the amazing animals and plants that call these icy lands their home. Life in the cold is not easy. The weather is freezing, food is scarce, and the conditions are harsh. Yet, many animals and plants have adapted to survive here. Let's meet some of these amazing life forms. Imagine a big fluffy white bear. Can you guess its name? It's a polar bear. Polar bears have thick fur and a layer of fat to keep them warm. Their white fur also helps them blend in with the snow and ice. This helps them hunt for their food, like seals. Now picture a bird with a tuxedo and a funny walk. Yes, it's a penguin. Penguins live in Antarctica, the coldest place on Earth. They have special feathers that keep them warm and dry. They huddle together to keep warm and take turns being in the center of the group. This is how they survive the cold. The cold regions also have special plants. These plants are small and grow close to the ground to stay away from the cold wind. They have dark colored leaves to absorb as much heat as they can from the sun. They grow slowly, but they are strong and tough. So, the next time you think of the cold, remember this. It's not just a harsh, freezing place. It's a home for many strong and brave animals and plants. It's a place where life has found a way to survive. It's a testament to the power and wonder of nature. As we end our sixth chapter, we've seen the magic of life in the cold. It's a world of strength, bravery, and survival. It's a world that shows us the true power of life. Let's continue our journey in the next chapter as we explore more wonders of water. Chapter 7. The Precious Drop. Water Scarcity. We have seen the wonders of water in the oceans, rivers, rainforests, and polar regions. Now let's visit a place where water is scarce, the deserts. Here, life has found remarkable ways to survive with limited water. Let's discover the amazing adaptations of desert life. Deserts are places where it hardly rains. The days are hot and the nights are cold. Yet, many plants, animals, and even people call these places home. How do they do it? They have adapted in incredible ways. Take cacti, for example. These prickly plants are true desert survivors. They have thick skins to reduce water loss. Their spines protect them from animals looking for water. And inside, they store water for the dry days. What about animals? Meet the desert's ship, the camel. Camels can drink lots of water at once and store it for days. They have long eyelashes and nostrils they can close to keep out the desert sand. Their humps store food, and their wide feet help them walk on the sand. People have also found ways to live in deserts. They wear loose, light-colored clothes to stay cool. They build homes that keep the heat out. They grow crops that need little water. They have learned to respect and value every drop of water. So, the next time you think of deserts, remember this. They are not just barren lands of sand. They are home to life that has found a way to survive with little water. They are places that show us the true value of every precious drop of water. As we wrap up the first part of this chapter, we've seen the magic of desert life. It's a world of adaptation, survival, and respect for water. Let's continue our journey in the next part 
as we explore more about water scarcity and its impact on our world. In the first part of this chapter, we learned how life adapts to survive in deserts where water is scarce. Now, let's focus on the struggles faced by people living in areas where water is hard to find. Water is essential for life. We need it to drink, to grow food, to keep clean, and much more. But in some parts of the world, people don't have enough water. This is called water scarcity. It can happen for many reasons, like too little rain, too many people, or when water is not clean enough to use. Imagine having to walk for hours every day just to fetch water. Imagine having to choose between using water to cook food or to clean your clothes. Imagine not having enough water to grow your crops. This is the reality for many people living in water-scarce regions. Children, especially, suffer in these conditions. They may have to miss school to fetch water. They may fall sick from drinking dirty water. They may not get enough food if crops fail due to lack of water. But people are strong and resourceful. They build wells to reach water deep in the ground. They collect rainwater in tanks for use during dry periods. They learn to use water wisely and not to waste it. So, the next time you use water, remember this. Water is not just a resource. It's a precious gift. It's a source of life and health. It's something we should never take for granted. As we conclude our seventh chapter, we've seen the human struggles and resilience in face of water scarcity. It's a world that shows us the true value of water. Let's continue our journey in the next chapter as we explore more wonders of water. Chapter 8. Conservation. The Need of the Hour. As we journey through the various wonders of water, we've seen its beauty, its power, and its importance to life on Earth. We've also seen how precious and scarce it can be. Now, we come to a crucial part of our journey. Understanding the importance of conserving water. Water is a gift. It's a gift that keeps us alive, grows our food, powers our cities, and supports countless forms of life. But like all gifts, it's not limitless. If we use too much of it, or if we waste it, we could end up with not enough to go around. Conserving water is about using it wisely. It's about not wasting it. It's about ensuring that there's enough water for everyone, for us, for our children, for the plants and animals, and for the generations to come. Conserving water is also about protecting our planet. Healthy rivers, oceans, and wetlands are essential for a healthy earth. They provide homes for wildlife, they help control the climate, and they purify the water we drink. By saving water, we're also saving these precious ecosystems. So, the next time you turn on the tap, remember this. Water is not just a resource to be used. It's a gift to be treasured. It's a precious drop that connects us all. It's our responsibility to conserve it. As we wrap up the first part of our eighth chapter, we've learned about the importance of water conservation. It's a lesson that speaks to our responsibility to the planet and to each other. Let's continue our journey in the next part, as we learn more about how we can conserve water in our everyday lives. We've learned about the importance of conserving water. But how can we do it? To answer this question, let's look at some inspiring stories of successful water conservation from around the world. Let's start our journey in Rajasthan, India. Here, in a small village called Piplantri, villagers plant 111 trees every time a girl is born. The trees not only provide shade and fruits, but they also help to conserve water. They hold the soil together, reducing erosion and helping the water to seep into the ground. This tradition has turned a once arid area into a green oasis. Now let's travel to Cape Town, South Africa. In 2018, the city was on the brink of running out of water. The city's residents came together to save water. They took short showers, collected rainwater, and used water-saving appliances. Within a year, they have the city's water used and averted the water crisis. Our final stop is in California, USA. In the face of severe drought, farmers have turned to a technique called drip irrigation. Instead of flooding the fields, they deliver water directly to the roots of plants. This method saves a lot of water 
and helps crops to grow even in dry conditions. These stories show us that conserving water is not just a responsibility, it's an opportunity. An opportunity to be creative, to come together, and to make our world a better place. So, the next time you use water, remember these stories. They remind us that every drop counts. They inspire us to do our part in conserving water. As we conclude our eighth chapter, we've seen the power of water conservation. It's a journey of inspiration, creativity, and hope. Let's continue our journey in the next chapter as we explore more wonders of water. Chapter 9. Water, the Power Source We've seen the many roles water plays in our world. It sustains life, shapes landscapes, and can be both scarce and abundant. Now, we will discover yet another way water is crucial to our lives as a source of power. Let's explore how water is used to generate electricity. Imagine a huge wall built across a river. This is a dam. It's a powerful structure that stops the river's flow. Behind the dam, the water rises, creating a large lake. This is called a reservoir. When we need electricity, we allow some of the stored water to flow out. As the water rushes down, it spins a giant wheel called a turbine. The spinning turbine is connected to a generator, which creates electricity. This process is known as hydropower. Hydropower is a clean, renewable source of energy. This means it does not produce harmful pollutants like burning coal or oil does. It's also renewable because we won't run out of it. As long as the water cycle continues, we can keep generating electricity from water. But hydropower is not without challenges. Building dams can harm the river's ecosystem and people who live nearby. So it's important to plan and manage these projects carefully. The next time you switch on a light or charge your phone, remember this. The power that you're using may come from water. It's yet another way water is vital to our lives. It's another reason to value and protect this precious resource. As we wrap up the first part of our ninth chapter, we've learned about the power of water. It's a lesson about innovation, sustainability, and respect for nature. Let's continue our journey in the next part, as we learn about another way we harness the power of water. In the first part of this chapter, we saw how water can be harnessed to generate electricity. This process, known as hydropower, has played a significant role in meeting our energy needs. But what does the future hold for water as an energy source? Let's delve deeper into the exciting prospects. The potential of water as a power source is not just limited to rivers and dams. Our vast oceans are a promising frontier in the search for renewable energy. One emerging technology is tidal power. As the tides rise and fall, they move a lot of water which can turn turbines and generate electricity, much like a dam. Then there's wave energy. Waves are caused by winds blowing across the surface of the ocean. By using special machines, we can capture the energy of these waves and convert it into electricity. Scientists are also exploring ways to use temperature differences in the ocean to produce power. This method, called Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, OTEC, could provide a steady source of energy all year round. These technologies are still being developed and tested, but they hold great promise. They could help us meet our energy needs without harming our planet. So, the next time you see a river flowing or waves crashing on the beach, remember this. They're not just beautiful sights. They're powerful forces that could light up our cities and power our future. As we conclude our ninth chapter, we've looked into the future of water energy. It's a journey filled with promise and innovation. In the next chapter, we'll wrap up our exploration with a reflection on our relationship with water. Chapter 10. Water and Climate Change as we come to the final chapter of our journey, we now focus on an urgent and critical issue, climate change. We've seen how water is essential for life, how it shapes our world, and how it powers our cities. But now let's examine how climate change affects the water cycle. The water cycle is a continuous process where water evaporates, rises into the sky, condenses to form clouds, and falls back to the ground as precipitation. It's a beautiful, delicate dance that has been going on for billions of years. 
but climate change is disrupting this dance. Warmer temperatures mean more water evaporates from the Earth's surface. This means there's more water vapor in the sky, leading to more intense rainfall in some areas. But in other areas, the increased evaporation can lead to drier conditions, making droughts more likely and severe. The impact of climate change on the water cycle can also affect our oceans. Warmer temperatures cause sea levels to rise as polar ice melts and the warmer water expands. This can lead to coastal flooding, putting people and wildlife at risk. Understanding the impact of climate change on the water cycle is crucial. It's not just about the environment. It's about our homes, our food, our health, and our future. As we conclude the first part of our final chapter, we've learned about the relationship between water and climate change. It's a reminder of how everything in our world is interconnected. In the next part, we will explore the role we can play in addressing climate change. We've talked about the impact of climate change on the water cycle. Now, let's turn our attention to another crucial issue, the rising sea levels. How does the warming of our planet contribute to this? Let's find out. The vast polar regions of our planet are covered with ice. This ice plays a crucial role in regulating the Earth's temperature. But as the Earth warms due to climate change, this ice is melting at an unprecedented rate. When ice on land, such as glaciers and ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, melts, it adds more water to the ocean. This is one of the main reasons why sea levels are rising. Even a small rise in sea level can have serious effects. It can lead to more frequent and severe coastal flooding, putting homes and lives at risk. But that's not all. The warmer ocean water also expands. This is called thermal expansion, and it's another reason for the rising sea levels. The rising sea levels are a stark reminder of the urgent need to address climate change. We need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and move towards cleaner, sustainable sources of energy. Remember, the challenge of climate change is not just about saving polar bears or far-off ice caps. It's about preserving our homes, our communities, and our way of life. It's about ensuring a safe and healthy planet for future generations. As we conclude our final chapter, we've explored the relationship between water and climate change. It's a story of change, challenge, and most importantly, of our responsibility. It's a call to action for all of us to protect and cherish our precious water resources.